We're going to visit Jim McCann, chief cook and bottle washer of JM Woodworks, one of the most talented and prolific woodworkers that I have ever worked with. And while I'm singing his praises, I'm going to show you just a few of the projects that he has designed and built. As you can see, his range is enormous. He's made everything from grandfather clocks, to acoustic guitars, to classical furniture, to modern cabinets, to turned bowls and boxes. If it can be made from wood, Jim can make it better than most. Jim and I first began working together on Hands On Magazine, and then he became an essential part of my team when we produced dozens of woodworking books for Times Mirror, Rodale Press, Meredith, and other major publishers. His craftsmanship has been seen and enjoyed by millions of readers. Today, he's an engineer who helps design and improve woodworking power tools of all kinds. And when he's not working on tools, he's working with them in his shop way out in the middle of Ohio's cornfields. There are many, many woodworking subjects that I could interview Jim about, but I thought one of the most interesting things we could do is just tour his shop. As you're about to see, Jim knows how to squeeze more craftsmanship out of a square foot of shop space than almost any other woodworker on the planet. And this is where the magic happens, huh? Yeah. Welcome to my <laughs> shop, Nick. Huh? It's not much bigger than a garden shed. In fact, it is a garden shed. Well, that's the little spot on the, on the right. Uh, the rest is about the size of a single car garage, but the back wall leans in, so that <laughs> Cuts off some of the floor space. So you have to have a car with slanted sides. Right. So here it is. Wow. Well. I like to be organized. I've seen tuna fish cans that were less packed. <laughs> Whoa. But there's, there's floor space everywhere. Uh, it's a one-man shop. Uh, you know, I've got walking around room for everything. I've got all the benches and tabletops the same height so that I can slide wood from uh, bench to bench to saw to wherever I need it. Um, all the drilling tools are with the drill press. All the sawing tools are with the table saw. The clamps are under the workbench where the, um, you know, where I glue things up. Um, I'm and you've got a work island right here in the center yep. that also serves as a as a feed service for your table saw. Right. Uh -huh. So I try to keep things kind of neat and tidy. You know, all my lathe turning is over here on the on the wall, disc sander. I like um, lighting, you know, task lighting at each um, apparatus. Uh, I like good general lighting. You know. it, it's as bright as daylight really is it, right it uh, that's the first thing I noticed you you, you don't have to squint to see anything no. anywhere and the high intensity lights are over the table saw and router where they're needed for all the detail setups okay so well let's 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 go through this as if we were doing a project uh, busting down the lumber how do well, you I'll bring I'll bring boards in uh, I think this is a five foot five step shop ah, okay so I can <laughs> I can move in five steps to anywhere in the shop. I can swing a five foot long board anywhere I want to without hitting anything. Uh -huh. And when I buy lumber that's longer than that, I can slide it in the garage door, bring out the chop saw, cut it to whatever size I need. Um, usually there's a lot of planning ahead of time. So I know that I can cut into a three foot and five foot piece out of an eight foot or whatever I need. Okay. Um, so there's a chop saw for busting up. now. Uh, jointer and planer. Um, jointers over here next to the table saw so that I can be ripping pieces down and going right to the table, uh, right to the jointer from the table saw. The um, nice six inch jointer. Oh, I, I see you did uh, the fingerboard thing on this. Right. Oh, uh, this is cool. And, and I can lock it against a pin so that I can, this is my third hand. Yeah. So that I, it holds it against the, the fence. Well, that's and then great. I just worry about pushing it through. Um, roller stand for longer pieces. Um, I try, you know, when I've got a something with a sheet of plywood, I try to um, bust it down on a couple of saw horses and cutting grid 
to manageable sizes, but there's enough length here that I can cut, I can rip down an eight foot um, board, an eight foot piece of plywood using the workbench as a, uh -huh. you know, as a support, in feed support. Uh -huh. uh, so it's, you know, it's quite a capable shop. I yeah, there, there's nothing, there, there's nothing in here. That, that, my shop is almost equipped the same way. It's just spread out more. Right. But I, but you know, I like to work in a small kitchen because you don't have to walk around much. And I like having, I like having things within an arm's reach. And it looks like, it looks like you're, you're keeping everything with the tools. Like I am. And this is, this brings everything <laughs> into arm's reach. There you go. It's my 10 pound apron. <laughs> okay. All right. You know, all my favorite toys are here. Square tape measure. You know, earplugs, little square sandpaper. Here's here's a neat tip. Take that quarter sheet of sandpaper. Mm -hmm. You know, rip it into four squares, fold it into thirds. That becomes a tool. Your yeah. your hand doesn't slip on it. It doesn't slip on itself because it's it's on the abrasive, and you can get right up to edges. This is a hard edge tool. Uh -huh. um, it forms around things or is rigid enough to stay flat. You know, that's that's one of my one of my favorite tools. If you get in my sandpaper drawer, you'll find They're all 20, 20, 30 pieces like that, <laughs> different grits. Even when there's a little piece, it's folded in thirds. Well, it uh, looks like you have just about used that apron to death. <laughs> they don't make them anymore. I know, I know. I had an apron like that. I wore it out, and I have not been able to find one. Right. So, we need to find somebody that's willing to make a 24... 24 pocket, pocket apron, apron. Yeah. I mean, this has wrenches in it. It's got my favorite little hand scraper that I've just about wore out. That's a hand scraper? Yeah, you can see oh, Stanley's yeah. still written on the side of it. I'll be... Look at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have you have taken this down to a bare nub. That's yeah, it for used sure. to be used to be three inches wide. Uh huh. Yeah, it's, it's a little more flexible and Easy easier to... on my whole. You know, I've got dust collection right here. I can turn it on wherever I am. Dust collection is hooked up to all these machines. I imagine, I imagine that's important in a small shop. You right. you have a lot of concentration of dust in the air. Right, and I've got. A filter up here in the ceiling that will clean the air as I'm working. Yeah, and it doesn't. It it does this small a volume. Not only doesn't take it doesn't take much dust, but it doesn't take much air movement to clean it. Right. So so and that's a that's a massive uh, air air filter for this size shop. Well, I, I believe in overdoing it. Yeah. Yeah. Too much is always just enough. I yeah. Mean, White lung disease is no fun. Too many clamps is just enough. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've got, they're all together next to each other. I uh -huh. can go grab whatever small clamp I need. Um, and then so you've got your bar clamps down bar here. Bar clamps under the bench. Okay. And uh, so I bet I'll, I can find all my sawing and routing tools here, right? Yeah, right here. Are the. So there's, there we go. Saw blades. Oh, my God. Look at that. Yo. Know, I do uh, product testing for companies, so they don't want to use blades back. So I've got a lifetime supply of of blades. What you think? <laughs> <laughs> I I'm gonna say I'm gonna say maybe five, ten lifetimes there. That's incredible. But uh, yeah, um, when I need to change the blade, I've got what I need. Yeah, and then some. Hey, that's a lot of choices. I do some light metalworking, so I've got specific blade for cutting aluminum. I've got a specific blade for cutting plastics. Uh -huh. um, of course, my dado set's down there. I've got two of them. So I even keep my, my wax and polishing rag right here for for waxing down the table, rubbing it out. So you you wax with hard paraffin? Uh, yeah, for the most part. Um, I've got the paste wax. I don't know that there's much difference. This is just convenient. It rolls up in the old sock I've been using for polishing for years. Sure. <laughs> and it sits right down here in the in the cabinet. Okay. So it's it's convenient. I don't have the can. I do have a can of wax in the uh, uh, in the cabinet. I use mainly for the paste wax, mainly for 
projects for finishing. Um, yeah, I've got all my little push sticks, my favorite, you know, pusher here. Um, that looks familiar. Yeah. We made a few dozen of these in our time. Yeah, some narrow push sticks when I when I need them. Uh huh. Um, stop blocks. This this stop block even has a an adjustment on it. That's a 1032 thread. So one wow. revolution is a 32nd wow. of an inch movement, 64th. 128. I can by the slot on the screw. I can tell where I am. Keep track of. So movement. you actually you actually threaded that screw through a piece of hardwood. Then. Yeah. So that's yeah. that's there's a 1032 thread in that's what cherry. Yeah. Yeah. And huh. that just um, it threads just like metal. Um, I just yeah. But take plus it, plus take there's a little stick to it, so right. it stays where you put it. Right. I oh. I put oil down into the, um, well, I use the oil on it just like I would cutting metal, uh -huh. and that oil causes the wood to swell and create a little tension on the threads. Okay. Now, so there's one, one, one half revolution going to be a 64th? Or 15 thousandths. Yeah. Yeah, you can, you can set these things up in, by the thousandth of an inch. That's cool. That is really cool. Some of these projects I've had to uh, work to that kind of precision. All right, so you've got a you've got a uh, a router embedded in your um, in your table here in your saw table, and mm -hmm. oh, I see. I was I was just about to ask you. This is this is ingenious. You've got to see this. I was about to ask you how you get the bits in and out and how you change the uh, the. Uh... It's magic. <laughs> Oh. Flip up router table. I've got full access to the to the router. I can bring it back here. Work on changing the bits. All my bits are down here. That's just the half inch bits. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you you have almost as many bits, almost as many bits as you have saw blades. I think I've got a few more. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's, you know, I've got dust collection here. Uh -huh. uh, it's just a loose box because I couldn't figure out how to attach it and stay out of the way of the router, so I left it loose. All right. I've got on and off clearly marked on my uh, switch there so that I don't get in trouble. That's an old Porter cable, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And then that attaches to a magnet. I see. Look at that. I like magnets. Do you use this router handheld or do you have another handheld router? I've got another handheld router. Um, I've got plunge routers. I think I've got um, five different routers. The handheld router is under the workbench where I use it. Outfeed table will hinge down, uh -huh. um, but I've got so much wood stored under there, it can't hinge down. Yeah, I, I, I saw the uh, I saw the wood. Is that that's where you keep your shorts, huh? Well, shorter longs, shorter, <laughs> longer shorts, shorts. However you want to think of it. Yeah, uh, I see some some next to, some uh, along the wall under the uh, under the uh, uh, the clamps. Yeah, that's walnut, poplar, pine over there, cherry. Um, I've got another corner that's got maple and uh, oak. Next to the disc sander, uh, yeah, you you accumulate wood. Yeah. Um, the <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. Until the board is completely used up, it doesn't go in the burn pile. This this scrap box gets filled up, but it's only you know little little pieces, which which can be useful too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I I know I know I know woodworkers are pack rats. Yeah. And for good reason, you know, you 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 have a small the minute you throw out a small piece, it seems that you need it. Especially when you're in the middle of the project. Yes. You're, you're, you want to match the wood, so you're keeping all the scraps. If you screw something up, you have to patch something in, or you um, have to add a part that you forgot or replace a part, then um, that scrap from those boards are essential to matching the project. Mm -hmm. Okay, so router, table saw. You got a band saw here. This is what, an old... Uh, Go ahead. old uh, it's a Delta. Um, I've had that since 
with the six Late inch riser 70s. in there too. Yeah. Yeah. I can do 12 inch resaw with it. Um, so I can I can slice a nice wide board uh, into thin pieces. Uh, I've noticed I've noticed here this is this is your outfeed for the bandsaw. Sure. <laughs> yeah. You got you got roller seams to sit on the floor for I got one for the joiner, uh, but this one is sits on the it's, tip. It's even adjustable a little bit. <laughs> um, that that I, is that is so clever. <laughs> yeah, I just made the the slot just wide enough to tap that pin in, uh -huh. and it holds together. Yeah, the um, the bandsaw is probably one of the most used tools. Yeah, you can I, do so much with it. Yeah, well, I I believe if 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 somebody said you can only have one power saw in your shop, I absolutely, would have, I'd have the bandsaw. Absolutely, that's it. Yeah, you know, behind you on the wall is dust collector. Yep, and you know, the, the dust collector sits in the corner. I've got hoses to a plenum box. I can uh, valve, open and close valves so that I've got appropriate dust collection wherever I need it. Um, extra hoses hanging on the wall behind it, mm -hmm. accessories hanging above it. Um, so that's, um, that's all contained. I've got my long clamps above the hose accessories. Um, this is one of my favorite tools it's a it's a clamping straight edge Ooh, let's bring this over here this is neat um it'll it'll clamp on a uh I'll, four by eight you can use it for layout you can use it as a cutting guide the tailpiece slides it locks in with pressure the little lock here goes down and moves that head just enough to provide locking pressure against here. Man, you could use that on about every other router operation there is. Yeah. That is, that's neat. And it's, and it's low profile, it doesn't get in your way. Yeah. Uh, this one is, will grip across a you know, four foot wide uh, sheet of plywood. Yeah. I've got cool. a shorter one, but I never use it because this one, this one does short and long both because that'll close all the way up. Yeah. Now I have I have made something like that, but uh, not as not as nice. And I like do like the low low profile. Mm -hmm. That can really help. That can really help, especially especially on uh, uh, when you're trying to get a router handle over over something like that. Right. So cool, cool. Um, yeah. It, along with my long bar clamps and. Okay. Long well, level. All right. So we're so we've 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 now we've now uh, busted everything down. We've we've made our we've made our joinery and our and our shapes here. Assembly. Well, before we get to that, I want to talk about the planer. Okay. I use that planer for surfaces and edges. Um, you know, you you rip something down. Mm -hmm. Run on the joiner, you got a square side um, to the face. Well, you start with facing it, then rip it down. Then you have to cut it to thickness, but you've got that last edge, especially when you're making you know, a lot of repetitive cuts, the same width, uh -huh. rails and styles on, on, a, on a cabinet piece. They're all going to be exactly the same width. Run them all through. Instead of running them over the joiner, I run them all through the planer. That way, they're all exactly exactly the same, the same width. Gotcha. gotcha. Uh, stand them up on edge and uh, run them through. Huh. Okay. Uh, great. Great tip. So, so you're using this as as the last pass over the joiner instead. It right. does the same. It right. does the same thing. Right. So, yeah, I can see. I can see for cabinet making when you've got a bazillion two inch rails. Right. Yeah. And it doesn't even need to be a bazillion. Four matters. Yeah. But yes. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> especially, especially if you're trying to keep things square. I just made a square box, and that would have that would have worked just beautifully, keeping right. everything exactly the same, uh, same the same width. width. Right. And then, yeah, you know, we've got variable speed on that planer so that I can adapt to whatever grain I run into. 
slow it down, smooth it out. Yeah. Um, that's a great machine. This is how I sharpened the joiner knives. Joiner knives with that six inch one, and then I made a a mate to it out of maple. Um, two knives go in um, that fixture. Uh, they're held. Um, they're held to the bottom of the, each of the grooves, held in with these set screws, and then I can just run them over the course and then the fine, counting the strokes. So, you know, ten strokes this way, ten strokes this way. Then I'll take um, uh, take one knife out, mm -hmm. put the third knife in where I took the first knife out, do the same ten, ten stroke and, and ten. ten, and then take the Knife uh, two out. Knife number two out. Put knife one, one back in. Do ten and ten. And, then and they, they all have thirty strokes. They all have thirty strokes. So and that with the aggressive, <laughs> I've got abrasive on all four sides. So this is just wet dry sandpaper. Yeah. On a glass plate. Right. Cool. And then that's there. It is for the six inch joiner knives. And then you've got them for the got this for the twelve inch joiner knives. And once again, you've actually threaded the wood here. Right. Drilled and tapped just like I would in metal. That's just a piece of hard maple. Yeah. I believe in sharpening things before I put them away. You know, all my chisels, I don't want to grab a chisel and it'd be dull. Yeah. You know, I want it to I want it I want it to do work. I've used your chisels before. I am <laughs> not gonna run my fingers over that. Yeah. I I'll pull them out of the box and they're They'll shave my arm sharp, but I put them away that way. Uh huh. Uh, my chisels are here. My sharpening is there, so it's all right. Con very convenient to um, pick it up and. This uh, is this. Is, what do you use to sharpen the chisels? You got a system? Um, diamond and ceramic. That's my diamond hone. I've got that's that's for doing rough work. This blue one, or the one in the blue box, is a medium, and the one in the white is very fine. And I just use water. You know, I use these acid brushes for everything, from putting down glue to sucking up glue. I know we go through we go through. We go through uh, Probably, probably a hundred acid brushes a month. The biggest trick to sharpening is holding the angle. Not only that, but working through all, progressing through all the, all the grits. Even if it's a little dull, I'll still start on the at least the medium before I go to the fine because that takes out anything. Um, and and you got to get a a sharp edge on the coarse before you can move on to a finer grit. Uh huh. And you can see me see me tipping it until the water squeezes out. Until the water squeezes out, and then I know I'm right there. the The capillary action of the water it it jumps from on the chisel to the on stone. the stone, and then I can move to the medium. I'm always pushing against the edge. Some people don't like to do that, but it keeps the burrs from rolling. Sharpening is very personal. Yeah, you do what works for you, and if Pulling the edge against the leather strap works for some guy. Great. I've just got another system. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is ceramic. This is the right height for me. Uh-huh. Yeah. With Which my, is another important, important thing for sharpening. You gotta see. You gotta have the light. Um, you've got to be able to see. You've got to be able to hold the chisels at the right angle. If I work this system on the workbench, uh-huh. I'm bending over. I'm going like this and this takes 10, 15 minutes sometimes, especially if I've you know ruined a ruined an edge by hitting metal or something, slipping and hitting the vice. Um, but up here, the only thing that gets tired is my hand sometimes. But you can see that chisel edge or that water just squirt out from under the edge. Yep, and then and then and then push. It squirts out and then goes. Somebody somebody saw me doing this. I, I'm feeling for drag against the skin of my finger. I'm really not. You're looking for cutters. 
now I'm looking for an absolute dead sharp edge. Um, but he said, why are you using your finger? Use your nail. And I said, use my nail. And if you, if you slide your cutting edge across your nail, it'll drag when it's sharp or it'll slip uh -huh. when it's dull. Huh. So that's, that's getting pretty close. I don't think I worked long enough on some of the finer or some of the coarser stones. because I'm having to work too hard on this fine stone. You know, you're, you're absolutely right about, about uh, sharpening being personal. I do, I do sharpening so much different, and yet I know that we get, we get similar results. Right, and a good friend of mine loves water stones. Uh -huh. And um, he, you know, he's... Um, the biggest water stone advocate I can think of. Yeah. And um, I don't, I've got some water stones. I've tested them. They work fine. This just suits me. It stays flat. You don't have to dress anything up. Um, just a little water cleans it up. Uh, I started with oil stones. Uh, the oil got messy. Um, water evaporates and, and doesn't leave a mess like oil. Yeah. You know, People swear up and down by what they love, and um, these stones are what I what works for me. Yeah, yeah, and I and and yet I I I uh, I love wet dry sandpaper. Yeah, well, that yeah, that's why that's why I was using on that. Uh, yeah, um, it's what works for you, what works for you. I, you know, I when I was teaching at the University of Cincinnati, I I never I was careful never to tell the students this is the right way or this is the only way to do right. something. There are so many different ways to accomplish what you need to, to do in a workshop. And it's, it, that's what, that's craftsmanship. It becomes personal. What's this? That's for honing um, gouges. Whoa, this is nice. Diamonds. This is a gouge slip. Right. Double-sided. Double-sided. Okay, fine. And coarse. So cool. Ah. That was one of the best. I, I found it on sale. It was a fifty dollar item. It was like thirty percent off. I got it for thirty five dollars. Um, yeah, you know, we got six hundred grit on one side and twelve hundred on the other. Wow, uh, that's nice, nice part of my system. Yeah, the drill press table is my sharpening surface. The, this is a this is a nice drill press uh, table here. The the uh... Uh, you've got a long, long fence on this, and these are stops? Yeah, stops. Flip stops. I can put them wherever I want. And if that fence isn't long enough, I can add this to it. <laughs> you know, it'll add you know, either side. So um, you know, it's just a T-slot rail on the top. Uh-huh. Um, and I can, I don't use it often, but there's times in a production situation, you know, you're building a taller cabinet or something like that. You've got lots of holes, lots of similar holes to the grill. You just mark one. Yeah. You set the stops. And then you do. And then you go ahead and do, you know, four others, yeah. two others. They're all exactly the same. Yeah. One of my themes through all of this from bust, you know, maybe not busting down. I work to lines, but from cutting to size, to drilling, everything, um, I say stop it. I don't mean quit doing what you're doing. I mean put a stop there and control the length against the stop. Well, when we worked together, I remember you controlled everything. You didn't, right. you didn't cut a board unless, unless it, was, it was attached by a straitjacket <laughs> to, the, to, the, uh, uh, to the miter gauge or whatever you were using. I, and I always thought that that was... Uh, that, that made so much sense. If the if the if the piece can't move in the in the fixture, then each each cut is going to be exactly the same. And it, it started with putting sandpaper on the face of the miter gauge. Yeah. Well, that face of the miter gauge is maybe six inches wide. I wanted something longer, so I double that or triple that with a piece of wood. Then something slides on the piece of wood. I add the sandpaper to that. Then I started with stop blocks just clamping it uh, onto the piece of wood 
um, and went to the adjustable stop lock like I showed you. Um, I've got a couple of cross-cutting, sliding cross-cutting table jigs with um, pivoting arms uh, for angles. They all have stops on them. They all have micro adjust stops. I can I can dial it into the nearest thousandth of an inch if I need to. Mm -hmm. And there are some projects. You know, this this is the column to a music stand I made for my nephew. I yeah, mean, I remember that music stand. That that it looks like poplar fluting, uh -huh. but look at that, it slides apart. Yeah, and you don't the, you don't get that precision. Uh, just uh, just by throwing something on a lathe and, and routing it. Right. This this is twelve pieces um, that are all interlocking, and um, slide. So this is the center column on a music stand. It it can adjust from sitting height to standing height. Yeah, let's. Um, there you there. can oh, you can yeah. see yeah. what that's made out of. Right here. Whoa. Look at this, guys. That's something. Everything's that. splined together. I had to work to a thousandth of an inch to get it tight enough to hold together and loose enough to slide. Well, and 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 the uh, and the precision holds because this is what ten years old. Uh, yeah, easy. Yeah, yeah. And and it's and it still slides extremely smoothly. One of the things one of the things that absolutely amazes me about this type of woodworking. Is uh, we've been working a long, a, a long time together. And forty-two years, man. Forty-two years, <laughs> and you're dyslexic. Yeah, you're dyslexic. I and you know yet when we were doing books together, you would catch more mistakes than I would. Well, I have to be careful because of the dyslexia. I have to think twice, measure twice, cut once. <laughs> Maybe I measure three or four times. Yeah, uh, my projects always take a little longer because I'm. Um, you know, very careful about, almost fanatical about making sure it's right before you cut good I, wood. I cut good wood. Yeah. Um, so I, I prototype things like that. I, I had to make a dining room table for a guy. He, <laughs> he couldn't he couldn't understand the drawing. Uh huh. You know the sketch that I made. So you so you I made a miniature. I made a miniature. <laughs> is this cool or not? <laughs> yeah, that was that was twenty years ago or more. But I, I keep it around. It's something to show people. Um, it's a beautiful cabriol. Look at that S curve. That is yeah, and, that's really gentle and and uh, and nicely proportioned. And and the taper is is gorgeous. But he couldn't understand that from from looking at well. There's a lot of people that could look at a cabriol on paper and not and not see the, see it in their mind. Right, right. So, so you know, it's things like that I keep around to show my capabilities. <laughs> um, but uh, you uh, you mentioned you mentioned something earlier. I want to come back to that drill press, by the way. Uh, but you mentioned something earlier, and before I forget it, you uh, you said you have several sliding tables. Could you show us your favorite? Yeah. I use this one more. I use this a hundred times more than I use this. I use this for just busting things down. Uh -huh. um, maybe for finger joints. But this is got a, a sliding stop. Uh -huh. It'll turn around and lock in for longer pieces. Um, the I added this board to the bottom so that I've got some support out here for uh, my stop blocks and things. Uh, sometimes I'll put a stop block, I'll cut a stop um, to the difference between two boards. Yeah, and then I can put this in here without adjusting the. The micro stop on the end, um, but this just yeah. You know, the the complement to that to this is where where does the scrap go? Yeah. So you have to put something for this to. And I just 
keep that nearby. The uh -huh. scrap falls off on there, and I can even slide the scrap away from the blade uh -huh. after it's cut off. Then, then I just throw it over there in the in the scrap box. Yeah, this this slides like it's on bearings, but it's just a wax table. Yeah, and everything is right here near me. Um, this other sliding crosscut table I use for bigger things. I made this when you and I first started um, and have improved it over the years. Oh you know, I've got more capacity to the right of the blade uh -huh. than to the left. left. I prefer to work on the left. I'm left-handed, all that. But I've got... I've got a sliding stop. I can I can move this bolt down here to other holes for longer capacity. This will adjust and pivot. Looks like you've got a what a full sixty degree swing there. Yep. Wow. So I can I can get to whatever I need to. The advantage of the smaller one is that it's got a very accurate scale on it. Uh -huh. This one I have to measure the angles. Yeah. Um, so that's um, that's how this one works. This is we made this when we were, uh, you yeah, know, this is a hands-on project from 1980. I re I remember this vaguely, <laughs> <laughs> vaguely when we, when we were in the hands-on, but but it. But it's only it's only vague. I, what I remember most is is being absolutely amazed at the numbering system you put on this. I mean, this looks like it's printed, but that's that's all your pencil work. Yeah, well, that's my drafting background. I've had I just put a coat of finish on this, and and I've stuck the stop in place. I'll have to work on that. Um, but the um, it's just laying it out accurately. Mm -hmm. And marking it with a, I used a real hard pencil that actually embedded into the poplar and then went over it with a soft lead pencil to yeah, make it stand out. To make it stand out. Huh. I would, now, see, I would have done that with my pocket knife and then, and then put the pencil in. That works too. Yeah. yeah. And then an a indicator arrow here to show me uh, how far it is to the blade, right? Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't indicate off the end of the block. That way, if I damage the block, I can cut the block off, get another square edge. Gotcha. Uh, and, and put another mark on the block. Right. Well, the the mark stays the same. I just cut the end off, and the mark. Well, yeah, yeah. I do have to put another mark on the block. Yeah. Yep. It would have to. So that I mean, this is this is my big sled and that's my small sled i use a small one a lot more than the big one this but, one for, but this this, this one if you, every now and then you need to do you do big pieces right and it surprises me that you can do big pieces in this shop but what what uh, do you ever feel confined at all in this uh in this space yeah sometimes they take off take more, you know more than i can chew bite off more than i can chew uh -huh. um yeah, a dining room table that I did that that model is for was a pretty big project. I also did six chairs to go with it. Yeah. Uh, all those pieces and parts tend to accumulate and fill up the shop. Yeah. Uh, the redo on the kitchen that I showed you, uh, that was all face frame work. It left the basic cabinets and just refaced everything. And um, I had to do that in two sections. So that uh, the uh, I could split the project into halves and only do half at a time because it filled the shop. Uh -huh. um, so I have to be careful. But I've got a neighbor that wants me to make a live edge table for him, live edge dining room table for oh, him. Oh my gosh! So that's gonna that's gonna fill the shop. It's oh yeah, gonna, absolutely. You know, trestle base and and large slab. I'll do a lot of the cutting outside and uh, assembly outside where I've got some, I'll set up the saw horses and the cutting grid, um, put plywood on it. So sometimes they just have to move out uh, to get the job done. Well, you've got a garage door there, so yeah, you, you, right. can do, you can do that. So, but right. uh, uh, well, anyway, let's get, let's get back to the- um, Back to the drill press? Yeah, I wanna, I wanna see this table. 
Well, the, you know, it has to be versatile. Um, sometimes, most of the time I use the fence, uh, just, just for precision and alignment. Two holes in a row have got to be against the fence, you know, four or six holes. When, when there's screw holes, I try to lay them out symmetrical uh -huh. so that I can turn the board around. But this, this table will move, the fence will move. Um, these flip stops, I can take them out, put them on the end, put them in the middle. I can turn them around. I've got left and right flip stops put together. Oh, I see. You've got you've got you've got the uh, I've got the edges ground there, so you can look stop out in the middle. Right. 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 Cool. Um, I can use this for drum sanding with the with the hole cut out in the in the tabletop. Sometimes that gets in my way for smaller pieces, but I keep you know. I've got cheese boards, <laughs> Swiss cheese boards that I use yeah. for, have been using for decades, literally. I know you, um, you get attached to those. <laughs> well, there's history there. Yeah. You know, hole in the center for uh, drum, drum sanding sander. also. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's if, a, that's if I, if I need, you know, this, this takes up, an inch and a half capacity. This is a small drill press to begin with. Uh -huh. um, sometimes, rarely, I have to take the whole table system off, but it's just knobs and carriage bolts, just like you saw on the router. Yeah. Um, and this, this fence will come off. Um, again, the lines on the end of the carriage bolt well, to so you can line up the- Square shoulders. Yeah, so. This is drill press, looks like it's from another century. It is. Um, that was my dad's drill press. He had he had a shop in the basement. Uh -huh. uh, that shop had a few tools: table saw, this drill press, a old jigsaw, and a disc sander. Um, disc sander was homemade. The um, jigsaw was an old Sears Craftsman cast iron behemoth. Uh -huh. um, this drill press and a Craftsman small craftsman table saw. Um, and he made everything from, um, well, some of the bigger things were, uh, I mean, similar things were bookcases, but then he, he made um, desks for our room, built-in shelves, um, a whole wall, um, dressing table and shelves for my, him, him and my mom's room. You know, he was, he was pretty crafty in himself. Well, you um, come by those pack rack Jeans, uh, honestly, huh? Yeah, um, he taught me well. I learned that those skills. I've honed them over the years. My plan when I was in high school, actually junior high, was to take all the shop classes I could, because that was the best part about school. <laughs> and um, was able to take drafting and woodworking and metalworking classes through junior high and high school. Um, three in each, and then my plan was to go and teach um, industrial arts, woodworking. And um, that kind of fell apart when I uh, had uh, lost the tolerance for the adolescent attitude, uh -huh. just being out of adolescence myself, and um, didn't, didn't finish that education program, turned it into a technology program, yeah. and went into engineering after that, so. I have my, my, uh, my grandfather was the one who taught me woodworking, and I have something in my shop that that uh, uh, he gave me. It, it's just a, a bunch of pigeonholes, but it's it's nice to have that continuity, right? You know, I, through generations. Yeah, and this thing this thing works sweet. I know. I it it, runs, it, runs it, perfectly. Well, you've, got it, you've got it so clean. You could you could uh, use it as a mixer. <laughs> so no, well, not quite. But um, yeah, I like. I like good lighting here. I've got task lighting. Oh, I didn't I don't have. That. Yeah, you've got two lights. I don't have any shadows. That's what it looks like with just, uh, you know, general lighting. But you add these two lights to it and you can see any detail you need to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, really, really, when you consider, when you consider the number of lights you have for the small space here, uh, it's pretty ridiculous. You could get a sun pan that's just, uh, just standing here. Uh, yeah, I've got, I've got, I think I was 46 fluorescent tubes in this uh -huh. shop. Um, and it's only 14 by 24. <laughs> so 
the lumens per square foot, I imagine, is pretty high. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're talking surface of the sun, <laughs> surface of the sun here. Close. Uh, oh, yeah. Go well, ahead. One, I, one of the things we should we we need to, we need to show them is I know that you have a beautiful old Emirate vice. Yeah, it's uh, it's the heart of my shop. Uh, this is yeah. Um, it opens up to fourteen inch. It doesn't have the quick release that new vices have. My God. These come out, of course. So you can get, wait a minute, let me measure it. I've got my tape right here. <laughs> 15, 15 inches. inches. Whoa. So I can, I can hold a whole drawer. That's. Uh, any box that I need to, it will. Um, and you've got you've, you've got four dogs on this. Yeah, these are these are a little stubborn. They take a bit of persuasion, but the persuader is nearby, uh -huh. and and it'll hold items that are tapered because the jaws rotate again. I mean, the cam rotates against the jaws, and and you, I mean, you get a swing out of it. You get a swing out of it. Okay. So, so and it, it'll rotate another way, don't you, right? Two other ways. Two other ways. Well, it'll swing up like this and around like this. Mm -hmm. Now it's got metal working jaws on this side. Uh-huh. So you can grab a small piece of grab a piece of metal and it is beautiful. It is beautiful and just so incredibly versatile. Yeah, I mean, they've they've tried to put out some copies over the years, but nothing nothing beats the real thing. The it had a um, gas pipe handle uh -huh. um, that came down and pinched your fingers and gave me blood blisters, so I changed that to white oak and cherry. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. That's nice. I you know, wear out these um, these jaws, you know, from using them over the years. And just run them through the planer again. Mm -hmm. um, now you use you use softwood in your jaws instead of hardwood, right? You know, those, those are white pine. Yeah, I I guess I guess that would that would keep from denting the pieces. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it and I think it grips better too. Uh, I've got you know this is the face grain up here and the the quarter grain here. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm squeezing against the, the annual rings. The annual rings. And with this being one of Mother Nature's laminating jobs, uh -huh. those um, dark rings are very hard anyhow. Yeah. The soft rings um, or the light colored rings are soft. So I think it grips the work pieces very well. Uh -oh. And um, it would. I, re I read in a book that somebody wrote. <laughs> that uh, that the the uh, uh, the summer growth on this is actually harder than ebony. Yeah, and uh, the uh, of course the uh, the spring growth is uh, is is uh, is lighter than balsam wood. But yeah, uh, and I use this a lot up here in this position because that that brings the height of whatever I'm working on up here closer to the to height that I'm used to sharpening on and in the you know uh, focus of my glasses yeah I I've noticed that throughout this shop there's there's not a lot of hunching that goes on <laughs> everything every yeah really everything everything comes up it comes up four or five inches higher than what I'm used to in our shop we we keep it low because of the cameras right but uh, but this is this you can stand up straight whatever you're doing here right and that that Provides more comfort over a longer period of time. Yeah. I've got mats on the floor to add to that comfort. Uh, it keeps my feet war warmer in the winter. Uh, it provides a soft surface underneath. I've found scraps of carpet over the years that I put under the mats mm -hmm. to add more comfort. Um, so it's all about working, you know, working comfortably, spending long hours in the shop, and and as little fatigue as possible. Well, the the only thing that I can see that uh, that really would uh, 
uh, drag it down is you would have a really hard time in this shop getting in your 10,000 steps. <laughs> yeah. That's true. That's but true. You, that you, then you don't wear a smartwatch, so what do you care? Yeah, that's so. right. <laughs> um, another thing about this bench that I created. Oh, are, oh. Any idea what those are for? I, I uh, have an idea, but I'm not, I'm not absolutely sure what. These are my bench dogs. Yeah. And this adjusts the height of the bench dog. So if I'm working with three quarter inch wood, I, I can fill up the hole. If I'm working with quarter inch wood, I can take out a couple of washers. And still be, and still have the dog low enough that you can plane. And I don't hit the I don't hit the metal dog with my chisel or sharp, hand plane. Freshly ch sharpened chisel. So I've got a row this way with that vise, a double row this way with this vise. And they just you know they're just they're just hex bolts. Cut where you've off. cut off the, the threads. Yeah, I, I first found these uh, square head bolts down at a surplus store downtown. And um, then when I went back to get them, they didn't have any more square bolts, so I bought hex bolts. Well, hex bolts work too, but it is nice to have that full that full. Uh, yeah, a little bit face. wider surface. Yeah. And it's just a half inch hole with a, I think it's an inch and a quarter uh, counterbore. Counterbore, that's... That's a that's a neat idea, really neat. It's interesting that in the small space you've worked in, you've worked in both a large workbench and an island workstation. Right. I island workstations just get I, I couldn't work without one myself. Right. I, you, sometimes you just need to walk around that project three hundred and sixty degrees, and yet you also need need sometimes just need a large flat surface right. on which to do things. If, if it's only just to beat your fists on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is this was a much narrower workbench when I bought it. Ah. Uh, but I made a project for my sister's uh, wedding that was out of these two by two squares, and I had scraps left over and just made a solid, um, solid filler here for most of the table. So you filled up the well with the uh, with uh, to get more surface. Right. I, I still keep my favorite, you know, favorite blocks that I use for clamping for. Um, These are coals. Right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this the well is much smaller, but it's smaller parts in it. Yeah, I I I I have made well. You have made them with me. We've made workbenches with wells, and I just never use them. Right. They fill up with stuff. Right. And and uh, the smaller the opening, the smaller the stuff that gets filled up. Exactly. The less uh, there is. Uh, um, but I've got, you know, my planes are all right here. Uh, two of my favorites are this this record rabbit plane and that uh, record. That's a low angle. Low what, angle. What is this? Block. A Sixty and a half. Uh, I think so. Kuntz cabinet scraper. Yeah. Um, spoke shave, but they're they're all my favorite cutting tools. They go in the drawer here. Do you use bench planes much? No, I really don't. That's um, I've got a small smoothing plane that I I use occasionally um, to get the warp out of a board or something. I'll plane the two um, the two high corners before I put it in the planer. Uh -huh. um, I made a live edge table um, last summer. Uh, and those boards, I, I put two boards together to make it wide enough, uh, and those boards both had a twist to them. And I have a friend of mine that's got a, a wide enough planer, I can, um, and he would let me run them through, but I had to straighten them because if you put a twisted board in, you get a twisted, twisted board, board out. out. Yeah. Um, and I use the, the smoothing plane for that. Um, it's in the back of the door here. But uh, you know, you taught me a good lesson with winding sticks. Yeah. You take two two sticks of different colored boards, make sure they're straight. Uh -huh. Then you can lay one on one end and one on the other end, and and sight across them, and you can see the twist, and keep planing and planing until those two boards are parallel to each other. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's a technique as as old as planes are. Yeah. This was one of my dad's tools, like the drill press was. Uh -huh. Um, hand me downs. I've got tools not only from my dad, but my grandfather and my mom's side. Um, 
a lot of tools, a lot of the mechanics tools were his. Yeah. They're old craftsman tools, and he marked everything with his initials, FP, Floyd Parks. Um, so yeah, that's my that's my planing drawer. Um, when you get to a finish, you got do you have several? Uh, do you have any art? Does the finish fit the project, or do you have a do you have any personal uh, finishes that you like the most? Uh, yes and yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, the finish has to fit the project. Well, I imagine the guitar. You, 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 you've got to put what's traditional on the yeah, guitar. Yeah, and that's a that's a spray lacquer. Yeah. Um, and you know, other finishes, depending on where they are, if it's a, a bathroom situation, it needs to be a, a spar urethane that'll han handle and hold up to the uh, humidity and, and moisture in the bathroom. Um, the kitchen uh, redo, I use multiple coats of a tongue oil based finish mm. called antique oil. Yeah. Um, so that that's that's really my go to finish is the antique oil is antique oil is tongue oil based? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. But it, and it's got a lot of um, bulk to it, I guess is the best they, way to they, put they it. They load it with solids. Now. Yeah, there's a lot of solids in it. Um, this is a project that I, I made you ever make a project, you had a great idea, you make it, you take longer than you should on it, um, and then you end up not using it because it, what your idea wasn't so good after all. That's that's what this is. Okay. Um, but that finish is just one coat of that antique oil with paste wax on it. Whoa. Whoa. There are a lot of solids in this. Yeah. Wow. And that's, uh, you know, wipe it on. It's easy. Wipe it on. Let it get kind of sticky before it gets really tacky, and then wipe it off. That's a nice little box. Breadboard, breadboard uh, ends right. that you miter so that they go in there. So, so this is this is a really nice project. It looks good. It just gets covered with dust. It's a gorgeous box. <laughs> <laughs> but the yeah, that's an example of antique oil. Um, I use that on the kitchen cabinets. I, you know, it's more than one coat. I think I put five coats on, rubbing it out in between. Uh -huh. um, and you know, got a um, good surface on the um, on the cabinets. It's durable. Those have been up for I think ten years now, uh -huh. um, and they don't show any uh, any signs of decay. The Kathy says that she hates them because they look so good she has to keep them she has to be so careful with them and, and keep them so nice uh, so you know the a spray polyurethane is a really nice finish for a, a quick turn finish uh, yeah because the antique oil will take you know literally can take weeks on a big project between drying times rubbing it out um, multiple surfaces and all yeah um, the you know, a lot of the turning finishes I, I'll use are friction um, friction shellac based, yeah. shellac and wax combinations, um, so that they go on and are worked in while it's turning, and the heat builds up and basically cooks the finish into the into it the would. turning. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's um, it it has to fit the the finish has to fit the project. Yeah. Uh, I know that I knew that you were big on antique antique oil. I'm big on tongue oil. Yeah. And I did not know that they were the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, but, but the antique oil just has a few more a few more solids in it. I, I think it does. It yeah. seems to build up faster. I have well see I, I do I do that same thing with the tongue oil. I take the tongue oil and I add a little spar urethane to it. So I'm basically making my own antique oil, and I had never knew it. Right, right. right. That, that's uh, that's cool. Another thing I do is when I'm just starting out, I will the I will sand the project with the wet finish on it. Uh huh. Uh, the spray polyurethane aside, uh, the the oil finishes, um, and even on the lathe. That way, that mixes the sawdust from the sanding in with the finish and that becomes grain filler yeah and that then i get a, a glass smooth finish with it whether whether it's going to be a, a matte semi-gloss 
whatever is going to be on it, it's still going to be smooth. You're not going to have the pores or the wood showing through. I just just did a marquetry project where I used a very similar technique to fill the uh, saw curves, the scroll saw curves, yeah. uh, with a with a sawdust finished slur. So, you know, the only thing we haven't talked about is lathe. Um, I I've got all my, you know, all my turning here, um, blocks. Uh, the yellow drawers are full of um, pen turning stuff. Um, that's a I'd be scared of this if it came at me <laughs> from an alley. <laughs> we had we had a uh, fifty foot, um, well forty foot, forty five foot, fifty foot um, blue spruce blow down in a tornado, um, two thousand four, and that was a root burl that was on the on the on roots the roof. that were um, growing from that tree. Yeah, you haven't you haven't turned it yet to see I what's inside. I haven't turned it. I don't know what's inside, but I couldn't, you know, just let them take it away when they took the rest of the root ball. Oh, absolutely not. So I, there's there's something good in there somewhere. Yeah, uh, I have no doubt. Uh, this is kind of fun. Oh, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> uh, that's an old spike of some sort that was driven into that tree. Don't know how many. And then the tree just covered it over. Millennium. Yeah, man. If you'd tried to, if you'd tried to lumber that, ooh, I don't like to even think about hitting that with a saw blade. And notice there's another aluminum nail that lines right up with it. That's more. It's closer to the surface. Ha. Huh. That same area had been used for maybe centuries for posting notices on that tree. That's that's a big spike for posting a notice. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> that must have been a really important notice. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Do you remember? Do you remember the uh, we were we were turning something. It might have been a clock part. I don't know, but you were. It was a piece of cherry. Yeah, it's a grandfather clock. Oh yeah, and and you you exposed a fifty caliber lead ball. Yeah. Uh, that, that it's been shot at the tree. Could have been Civil War. Yeah, it could have been Revolutionary War. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so yeah, you find stuff in the trees that that there's still a stain in that clock, um, in that spindle from that lead. Oh, really? Uh, but I ended up cutting away all that uh, that lead. But suddenly I'm turning away and there's this shiny spot. Uh -huh. you know, it's like somebody's holding a pencil against it, uh, and it got wider and wider and turned it off and there's this round ball and um it definitely picked it out it was it was a round sphere um it probably came out of a, a early firearm yeah well, the uh the, those 50 caliber muskets were pretty pretty um uh they were everywhere in the civil war right. so so uh but i just i remember that and i'm th i'm thinking man History, wouldn't yeah. you? Wouldn't you love to be able to dial dial this one back and figure out where it came from and what he was shooting at? Oh, okay. This is this is a. Uh, it's just a it's just a small simple lathe. Uh huh. Um, I got a really good deal on it. It was almost free, um, and you know the the tubular ways um, are a little flexible, so I've got these wedges that I put underneath for heavy turning. Um, they. Oh yeah, that it bounce if if with, with. Yeah. Um, I do you know small, eight inch, bowl turning, um, uh, and do some spindle turning on it. It just, uh, it's just real convenience. Uh, with the cabinet underneath it, it uh, has a small footprint, lots of storage. I noticed that you can turn the head around so that you can do face plates turning bigger things. Out, out on this side. In theory, you can do that. I've just never no done right. it. Yeah. Um, it's when I bolted it down, it just never moved. Wow. The um, the sanding station there is kind of the same way. I I planned on putting that. Um, can we can we bring that over? This is this no. Is, it's, it's oh, it's solid. It, it's solid right there, isn't it's, it? It's screwed down. It's not going to go anywhere. Uh -huh. I had planned on putting it on a lazy susan. So I could swing it around and use the drum sanding on the other side, um, but 
just never got done. I was was did we make this for our sanding book? Yes. Ah, I was thinking that this was was familiar. This is nice. Uh, I use it all the time for you know everything from you know sanding wood to um, sharpening. Uh, yeah. I like a flat bevel. I don't like a hollow ground bevel on my tools. And I'm, I'm the same way. And you we you I see you've adapted this so you can reverse the motor. Yeah. Uh, that way, I can I I can sand around this side, or I can sand around this side by reversing the direction. Oh, here's here's a piece left over of that. Uh, yeah, uh, that's bark bark included uh, oak. Yeah, and that lace wood is one of my favorite things to turn. This is this is unusual. These these are pieces of bark. And, yeah. and that's what I made that Soji screen from. Right, right, yeah. Uh, again, 12 inch capacity on my resawing. I sliced this board into four pieces. I know, I know. It, it came out, the screen was like, what, three thirty seconds of an inch thick? Something right. Like that. And the, the frame Absolutely is a quarter amazing. inch thick. The whole screen by, well, actually, the packaging weighed to ship it weighed more than the screen did. Yeah. Um, it only weighed like six pounds Tough. Uh, when I was done with it. Wooden hinges um, folded right up. I figured out that design in the middle of the night, woke up and sketched it. And that, these are pieces of lace wood, right? Right. And then those are, those long pieces are my cutting guides for the saw. But I love turning lace wood. Uh, when you get these wide uh, the rays, rays, then you, you turn them and uh, you can, in, depending on which way you turn them, uh, you can increase the width of them going down the the sides of the of a flat platter like this. Mm -hmm. I've made you know this is only inch thick wood, and I've made a lid and a bowl, both an inch thick and inch tall, um, that come together. I'll cut a section out for the base and another section right next to it for the lid, and then. When I turn them, I'll flip them. Uh -huh. So then the, the grain stays matched on the two uh, two pieces and they'll line up when it's done and it looks like it's made from the same piece. You gotta wear your dust mask with it, at least I have to. This lace wood just um, makes me sneeze for an hour. It was like uh, that coffee wood we had once, remember? Yeah. We got that, that uh, Kentucky coffee tree wood. And it and, ran us both out of the shop. And the Coca Bolo, too. Oh, the, yeah, no, that was awful. Well, um, anything we missed you can think of? Probably. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we've covered most of it here. Um, with projects inside, you've seen what, uh, what good comes out of this shop. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, see my. Yeah, I'm I'm a one-off kind of woodworker. I, I build presents for family members. Um, I take a year to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, the guitar took uh, over a year because of research, figuring out what Drew wanted, and then figuring out what what I could make. I I can make anything. A guitar is just a box with a handle on it. Right. Until yeah. you put strings on it and give it to somebody that knows how to play it. Yeah. Then it becomes a wonder. Well, you certainly made him happy, and it certainly does have a beautiful sound when he plays it. Well, that that tone is partially all your fault. <laughs> you gave me the tone wood for the uh, yeah. for the front. Uh, that spruce was incredible. That has annual rings that are you know, you, sixty you, rings to an inch. Yeah, you'll 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 never find that again. That was that came out of Alaska. Yeah, that so. was incredible. It's uh, one of those boards that you once you see it, you can't you can't, you can't walk away from it. No, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's worth anything you pay for it. Have you ever have you ever thought about enlarging it? Yeah, but where would I go? <laughs> you know, I've got things where I like them, way way I like to work. Um, if I were to enlarge it, it would be for for an enclosed, um, air purified finishing area. Finishing, area. yeah, that's that's about the only thing you could want here. I mean. He, you certainly, you certainly won't get better woodwork out of a bigger shop. Right. So just take more steps. <laughs> right. Exactly. 
All right, it's great having you, Nick. I, I, I love showing off. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, I couldn't tell. <laughs> well, I'm glad you did. <laughs>